Well, hello, English 111 students. This is Dr. Mark Tinsley, and you are in week six of English 111 fall 2020 semester. And week six covers uh, September 28th through October 4th. And this week, we're going to be talking about academic honesty and the MLA format. Okay, so academic honesty and the modern language association format that you're going to be expected to draft your papers in uh, for the remainder of this semester. Now, you should have, by the time you listen to this uh, lecture, you should have already turned in essay number one. Now, you're going to have to give me at least a week to grade those papers. I wish I could turn them around in a couple of days, but that's just not realistic. I've got two full, very full classes of papers to grade. So give me a week, uh, maybe a day or two more. Just be patient. I will get them graded, and I will give you honest feedback um, and hopefully uh, the appropriate amount of feedback for uh, for your paper. I want you to learn from this course. It's not about giving you a grade, right? That's why I say in the beginning, don't worry about your grade. Let me worry about your grade. I want you to worry about doing your level best on each and every paper, on each and every assignment. And I'm going to help guide you and hopefully grow you through the writing process, becoming a more seasoned writer. That's what this class is about, right? That's we want, to, we want you to become a more seasoned writer, and we want you to learn critical thinking. That's what we said in the beginning. If I expected you to know everything about writing, <laughs> we'd pass you through this class. You wouldn't have to take it. But the assumption is that you need, you know, everyone needs more help. Uh, growing in their ability to write and their ability to communicate through the written word. And so that's what we're here to do. That's what I'm going to help you do. Okay, so I'm going to give you feedback. Be patient because giving feedback takes me time. All right, enough said on that. Uh, this week you're going to be reading chapters 21 and 22 in your textbook, so make sure you've done that. You're going to be taking quiz three, open book, 10 questions, just like before. So read chapters 21 and 22, take quiz number three, and we're going to talk about your topic selection for essay two at the end of this lecture. So hang in there, okay? All right. So let's talk a little bit about academic honesty. This is a topic that we need to address because if we don't, some of you may misstep and find yourself in the realm of plagiarism, and I don't want that, and neither do you. So let's talk about academic honesty. All right, just take a minute if you want to pause this recording. That would be great, uh, or you can just take a, a few seconds to think of it, think about this as, as as I talk. But I want you to think about your definition in two or three sentences of what plagiarism is, because when we talk about academic honesty, or maybe I should say academic dishonesty, this is typically what we're talking about. Now, there are other forms of academic dishonesty, but plagiarism is the big one at the college level. So two or three sentences, what is your definition of plagiarism? And then think about some examples or types of plagiarism, okay? So take a minute and do that. All right, again, pause the recording. Okay, well, I hope you paused. Uh, or and or I hope you took some time to think of a definition of plagiarism. So what'd you come up with? What is it? Well, here's my definition, which is based on lots of reading and experience, right? But plagiarism is when we take the words or we, words or ideas that are used from someone else without giving proper credit, without giving proper attribution. So if I take someone else's words or I take someone else's ideas and I use them and I don't give them credit for it, I don't say anywhere through citation or anything else that these are not my words, they are someone else's, then I have committed plagiarism. Notice it's words and ideas, and this is what will trip some people up every now and again. It's not just exact words, it's also ideas. If I steal someone else's brainchild, right, their idea, and I don't give them credit for it, then I have committed plagiarism. I may not use the exact same words to describe the idea, but the idea is not mine, and I've not given credit for the idea. I'm still guilty of plagiarism. So a lot of people mistake plagiarism as just word for word copying. That is a form of plagiarism, but plagiarism also involves ideas. It includes words. We we said that already. It also includes images, music, 
poetry and other creative works. If it's written by someone else or a, it's, a, it's an image formed by someone else, uh, music, whether it be lyrics or notes created by someone else, and we take that and we don't give credit, we are plagiarizing. We are also plagiarizing if we borrow someone else's framework for an argument and we don't give them credit. In other words, if you go to Wikipedia, let's say you're going to do a, <coughs> a paper on uh, a ph philosophical topic. Um, say you want to do a paper on realism. What is realism? If you go to Wikipedia, you search realism, and you look at the big, bold... Uh, uh, headings, headers within Wikipedia f under the topic of realism, and you take those bold headers and you use them as the sections in your paper or as the, uh, uh, the main points for your topic sentences in your paper, and you don't give credit to Wikipedia for that framework, then you have just committed plagiarism. Okay, so these are some forms of plagiarism. So plagiarism generally is when we take someone else's stuff and we pass it off as ours without giving them credit for it. We take someone else's creative work, someone else's brainchild, someone else's words, someone else's ideas, someone else's argument framework, someone else's image or music or lyrics from music or poetry or creation and we say hey this is mine or we just pass it off and suddenly pretend that it's ours or imply that it's ours and we don't give credit we are guilty of plagiarism now, I don't want to beat a dead horse but we need to understand this before we move on if you don't understand something that I've just said I need you to email me call me text me something we need to talk about it okay we're gonna continue in this lecture <laughs> this isn't the only thing I'm gonna say about it but anything you don't understand in this lecture, contact me because we need to work it out. I don't want you to make the mistake of, of, of tripping into plagiarism. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So when do you give credit? I've talked about giving credit, right? So when do you give credit? Well, here's a general rule. Give credit where credit is due, right? If someone else did something, give them credit for it. That involves direct quotes. If I pull a direct quote from somebody else's work, then I, by golly, I better be giving them credit for that direct quote, right? Um, if I pull facts that are not widely known from someone else's work, right? Statistics, facts, anything like that, then I must give credit. Uh, if I'm using someone else's opinion or someone else's claims, I need to give credit. Again, we said images, photos, creative works. I need to give credit. Statistics, tables, graphs. I know when I was a science major and undergraduate, I, I, so there, there was a short period of time where I, th I didn't think if you, you were using somebody else's tables or graphs that you had to give credit for. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that someone else created, you did not create, and you're using it in your work, you must give credit including ideas and frameworks, as we've already said. Okay, If it belongs to someone else, it was created in the mind of someone else, by the work of someone else, um, then you must give credit for it. When don't you have to give credit? Well, there's this thing called common knowledge. If you are... Um, if something is very commonly known in the culture or in the to the audience that you're writing to, then you don't necessarily need to give credit. Um, for example, if you were going to state that uh, in your paper that John F. Kennedy, the former president of the United States, was killed and assassinated uh, in 1963, well, you might read that in a book, right? And, but that is very much common knowledge. You, you know, that fact can be found in multiple sources, and, and that's kind of my second point. It's common. People know that John F. Kennedy, JFK, was killed in 1963. It's not necessarily something you need to reference. It's very commonly known. The sky is blue, common knowledge. Uh, the moon is 200,000 miles away from the earth, common knowledge, right? These are just simple facts and things that most everybody knows or would reasonably be expected to know, okay? Facts that are found in multiple sources kind of falls into this category. So if I go to one source that says 
you know, I'll use John F. Kennedy again. John F. Kennedy was killed in 1963. I go to another book, it says the same thing. I go to a, a journal article, it says the same thing. I go to a magazine article, it says the same thing. I watch a YouTube video, it says the same thing. That's found in multiple sources. I don't necessarily have to cite that. Because the question is, what source would I cite anyway? There are a hundred sources that say it. Which sort of my, what source am I going to cite? So you have to be careful with these, common knowledge and multiple sources, because just because something's found in multiple sources doesn't mean it's common knowledge. So you have to be careful. And I'm going to give you a little rule of thumb to, to follow here in just a minute that I think will clear it up. All right? Um, so you don't have to give credit for common knowledge. You don't have to give credit for facts that are found in multiple sources necessarily. Um, you don't have to give credit for independent research. If you do the research, you don't have to give credit to somebody else because you did the research. And if you have, if it's an independent creation, it's a poem you wrote, you don't have to give credit to anybody, right? I mean, it stands to reason. It's kind of common sense. It's your poem. Why would you give credit to anybody else? Okay. Here's the rule of thumb, though, when it comes to when not to give credit. When in doubt, give credit. Hear me again. When in doubt give credit. So I don't care if it's found in a million sources. I'm going to tell you what I do. If I find, here, here's my rule of thumb, when in doubt, uh, give credit. And I'm in doubt if it's something I don't know. Okay? If it's something I don't know, even if I think it's common knowledge, even if I think it's found in, I see, I, I see it in multiple sources. If I didn't know it before I read it, I'm citing it. Does that make sense? So when in doubt, give credit. And if you don't know the information, always give credit. Okay. Those are two rules of thumb that will largely keep you out of trouble. Okay. I would not try to apply common knowledge and facts found in multiple sources at your level of education. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not saying you're not educated. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm just saying you, most of you, most of you, not all, but most of you have had very little writing experience very little formal writing experience, I should say. And so trying to um, expertly apply this common knowledge rule or the facts found in multiple sources rule might get you in trouble. So I would say always doubt yourself. If you find it in a source, cite it. When in doubt, cite, okay? Now, if it's your independent research or your independent creation, obviously you don't need to cite it. Okay, I hope that's as clear as mud. Let's go on. Here's the dark side of plagiarism. <clears throat> this is my slide. <laughs> I call it the dark side of plagiarism. Plagiarism is sometimes subtle and unintentional. And, and you know what? I read an article by a Yale professor one time, and, and she said that um, everybody has plagiarized. She goes, it happens to everybody at some point. You just make a mistake, and you unintentionally or subtly plagiarize, uh, and you just don't know you're doing it. Or you get sloppy, and you do it. I mean, it, we're, we're fallen, frail human beings, aren't we? I mean, all of us... Um, none of us are perfect. We know this. I'm not trying to throw cl cliches at you, but we aren't. I mean, we're just, we're fallen, frail people. We have weaknesses. We, we have weak moments. I mean, we make mistakes. And you're going to fall into it eventually, I'm sure, if you haven't already. Um, but we want to avoid it at all costs. We want to do everything we can to not fall into the trap of plagiarism. Um, and so here's some things to think about. When you take an idea... Um, or, or here's, here's the dark side of plagiarism. I'm sorry. I was getting ahead of myself. It's easy to fall into plagiarism when you take an idea and don't give credit. Because sometimes we think ideas are, uh, are kind of free game. Well, it's just an idea. I'm not stealing words. We've kind of talked about this already. But uh, it's just an idea. I didn't steal the words. Yeah, but you didn't have that idea. That idea was not in your brain before you read this person's book or article or whatever. So you need to give credit. Or sometimes when people paraphrase too closely to an original, um, they say, oh, I'll just change a word or two. Folks, if you just change a word or two in a paraphrase, you have not, let me say it again, if you change just a word or two or three or four words in a paragraph that you're quoting uh, and you say, hey, I paraphrased it so I don't need to offer uh, a source, um, you're, you're wrong. First of all, if you paraphrase too close to the original, you've committed plagiarism, even if you put quotation marks around it. Or, excuse me, even if you put a citation at the end of it. And even because what you're saying is these are my words, 
not someone else's. But all you've done is change a few verbs or nouns or something out. You've not really changed the character of that sentence or that paragraph. So if you're going to paraphrase, paraphrasing is when you change the word order, you change the verbs, the nouns used, the, the, the structure of the sentence, the framework of the sentence. It's totally rewritten by you in your own words, in your own way, with your own style of writing. That's a proper paraphrase, not simply changing some words out. Please hear me on that. Okay, so if we steal, if we take ideas, we don't give credit, that's plagiarism. And that can be very subtle. Or when we don't paraphrase well enough. When you paraphrase, again, paraphrase, uh, use different sentences, different verbs, different nouns, different sentence structure, different word order, everything. Make it completely yours in your own style. Don't copy at all. All right? And then finally, here's a subtle way that we can plagiarize. When you leave out parenthetical references. Folks, we're going to learn in the MLA format that we use parenthetical references. Uh, even if you use quotation marks, you've got to put at the end of anything that you're using, any, the end of anything, whether it's an idea, a direct quote, a paraphrase, whatever, at the end of that sentence, you have got to put parentheses with a citation in there to tell the reader where you got the information for that idea, that paraphrase, or where you got those direct, that direct quote. Because if you don't, you're going to be guilty of plagiarism. Now, I'm stressing plagiarism a lot because it's a big deal. It's one of the, it's one of the uh, Achilles heels of the academic environment, of academia, of college education. Plagiarism is rampant. So many people do it, and many do it intentionally, but oftentimes many, uh, many others do it unintentionally or subtly. They don't, they don't even necessarily know they're doing it. They just get sloppy, and uh, I just don't want that to happen to you, okay? So remember the dark side of plagiarism. Um, let's talk about uh, the MLA citation. I hope, I hope that clears up a little bit what plagiarism is. Um, and uh, if it doesn't, again, I need you to contact me because I want to make this clear for you. I want you to know what it is so that when you write your next paper, your no, or in the papers you write in the future for the rest of your academic career, the rest of your life, you don't get into these subtle forms of plagiarism. Now, I can't stop you from intentionally plagiarizing. And that's a character thing. And I would encourage you to really search your soul, search yourself, search your conscience, search who you are on the inside and say, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to violate my value system and my integrity and do this thing called plagiarism? Do I really want to steal someone else's ideas and words or a structure or framework or whatever? Because I had a professor undergraduate tell me this one time. He said, if you cheat, and he was just talking about cheating in general. He said, if you cheat, I may not catch you. He said, I probably won't catch you if you're good at it. He said, but guess what? Your conscience will catch you. And he said, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, this will weigh on your conscience. He said, you don't want that. Avoid that. Just avoid cheating and everything. You'll have a clear conscience. Excuse me, a clear conscience later in life. And that's what I would tell you now. Avoid this plagiarism thing, this, this form of cheating, because uh, you want to have a clear conscience 20 years from now. And you don't want to be dealing and wrestling with this, okay? All right. Let's talk about MLA formatting. Modern Language Associations, what MLA stands for, their citation format. Um, you know, what is a citation in general? A citation is just a reference. It's a way of saying to your reader, this is where I got my source. This is where I got my information. Um, that's all a citation is. You're citing your sources. It's used for several reasons. First of all, it's used to avoid plagiarism. And that's our, you know, you say, okay, that makes sense. This is a plagiarism, or at least the first part of this lecture was about academic honesty or plagiarism. Well, that's only one reason. The other reason is you want your reader, the other two reasons are, you number one, you want your reader to know where you got your information. You want them to be able to go back if they have more questions about whatever information you're talking about. Uh, they can go back to the original source and read more about it. And then thirdly, um, it gives you credibility. When you include citations, it shows your reader that you've done your research that you have from credible sources, and that they can trust you. Remember, this goes back to the credibility we talked about earlier in the, in the course. 
Okay, so why do we use it? To avoid plagiarism, right? Uh, to show our readers where we got our information so they can go back and research it more if they want to. And then thirdly, to give ourselves credibility so our readers will trust us. Okay, there are many different types of citation styles. We're going to look at the modern language association style. That's the standard in this class. But there's also uh, the American Psychological Association, APA. There's also Turabian or the Chicago Manual of Style. And you'll find that there are lots of other independent formats out there used by journals and, and uh, book publishing companies, etc. So formats abound. But the three big ones you'll run into in college are Turabian or the Chicago Manual of Style, APA format, and MLA. And again, MLA is what we'll use in this course. Some general rules for using MLA. The first, is, or any citation style, all academic research papers should have a bibliography or works cited page. Everyone. And this, what you see up here, is an example of a book citation in a works on a, in any works cited page. Uh, this is actually a book that I authored, uh, actually prior to 2015. Uh, but this is how you would do it: Tinsley, comma Mark A. Elements of Earth Science Laboratory Manual in italics. Kindle Hunt, which is the publishing company, 2015 period, and you're done. All right, it's very simple, uh, and we'll talk about where you find those formats in just a minute. Okay? So, got to have a works cited page. General rule number two, all uses of someone else's material in a paper should have an in-text citation. And an in-text citation is that parentheses I was telling you about a little bit ago. That's when you... At the end of a sentence, you put a parenthesis and you put in there, generally what you put in there is the author's last name and the page number in which you found the source. Okay, so in this case, if I found something in my manual on page 14, I would put in text at, after the sentence where I reference the fact or statistic or whatever I'm using, I would put Tinsley 14. Now, what does that do? You say Tinsley 14, that doesn't tell me much. Well, it doesn't right there. But what that tells the reader is go to the bibliography and find the work by Tinsley. So they go and they find the larger citation in the work site page, Tinsley Mark A, Elements of Earth Science Laboratory Manual, Kindle Hunt, Kindle Hunt 2015, and that tells them everything they need to know. Then they can go find that book if they want to, and then go to page 14 and find the reference. Does that make sense? The only time you don't say author's last name and page number is if you use the author's name in the sentence. For example, if I said, Tinsley said, blah, 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 then I wouldn't have to put Tinsley 14 in parentheses. I would just put 14, because the assumption is I know Tinsley, the source is, it was written by Tinsley because I said that in the sentence. But if you, and I'm just telling you this as your professor, uh, if you were to put Tinsley 14 at the end of that sentence, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything about that, okay? Rule number three is that all in-text citations should have an accompanying entry in the works cited page. All right, so if you have an in-text citation in your paper, you got to have the bibliographic entry in the works cited page. That makes sense, right? Because if I just have Tinsley 14, but there's no larger bibliographic entry at the end of the paper, then I don't know what Tinsley 14 means. I don't know where to find that. So if you have an in-text citation, you must have a bibliographic entry. And it really goes the other way too. If you have a bibliographic entry, you should at least use that source at least one time in the paper somewhere. So I should see an in-text citation somewhere. So you can't have one without the other. All right, so the rules are all academic papers have a works cited page. Number two, all uses of someone else's material must have an in-text citation. And number three, all in-text citations should have an accompanying works cited page entry and vice versa. I hope you understand that. If not, if you don't understand anything, right? Write me, call me. All right, let's do a practical exercise. Now, in class, we would do all of these. I just want to do two today for our practical exercise, okay? I want you, now, this is how I'm going to, well, let me pause for a second and say this. I could sit here and I could, we could go through exhaustively and, and ad nauseum how to do uh, the different entries for a journal article a magazine article, a website, a book, a book with one author, a book with three authors, um, you know, a dissertation. We could do that, but it would bore you and me to death. And let's face it, at the end of the day, we wouldn't remember it anyway. That's why you have chapter 22 in your textbook. 
And I want you to turn to chapter 22 right now as we're talking. It should have a red border around the, the, the margin of the page. And this is the MLA format. It tells you in this chapter how to do every kind of entry, virtually every kind of entry you can think of. All right? So what I want you to do is I want you... Let's practice with this. I'm not going to teach you how to do every one. I'm going to teach you how to use chapter 22. And by the way, I would keep this book if I were you because this book, chapter 22, and chapter 23 for that part, uh, are wonderful, wonderful um, references for the MLA and APA styles. Now, we're not using APA in this class, but you might use APA in a science class or another class, a social science class or a physical science class. So, hey, keep it around. You might use it. This is a pretty exhaustive uh, reference manual. You don't find this a lot in this kind of detail in a, in a lot of places. So I would keep this if I were you. But anyway, let's do a journal article. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn in Chapter 22 to where you find the bibliographic entry for an article in a print journal or a print journal article. Okay? Now you'll see that uh, I have a slightly different book than you all have, so I can't tell you the page number I'm on right now, but if you find it, it will show you an example of a proper bibliographic entry. And you simply pull out, you take that as a template, and you pull out that data and put your data in. Okay? So let's look at this journal article right here. I'll give you an example. We'll go through one, and you'll see what I mean, I think. So here's a journal article here. It's from... Uh, the Doak Lady, uh, what is it? Uh, Doak Lady Earth Sciences Journal. Uh, I'm, I'm looking up in here, by the way. You'll see it's from 2019, volume 49, part or number 2, pages 1469 to 1473, right? So that's the information I need to do a proper journal article entry, and I'll also need the title and the authors down here. So with all of that information, I want us to write, I want you to take a stab at writing a proper bibliographic entry. I want you to pause this lecture and I want you to take a stab at it. Now here's the thing you got to remember before you do that. All periods and commas in the format in your book matter. If there's a period or a comma, you need to include it. Parentheses, italicies, uh, uh, quotation marks, they all matter in the format. So, this is a journal article, an article in a print journal. I want you to take a stab at how you would write this uh, bibliographic entry. Pause, and then hit play again when you're ready. Okay, so I hope you paused it. Let's look at how we would write this. Okay, I may butcher these names, so give me some grace. Levchenko, comma... OV, first, in, first initial, middle initial, comma. Now, notice that was last name and then first and middle initial, right? So it wasn't OV Levchenko. It was Levchenko, comma, OV, comma. Now we're going to go to the next author's name, but notice now that it's first name followed by last name. So you only do last name first for the first author. Now it's U.G. Marinova, comma, M.V. Portnagin, I probably butchered that, comma, R. Warner, comma, and L.I. Lobkowski, period. All right, then quotation marks, the, the title of the article, new data on the geology of Osborne Plateau, Indian Ocean, period, quotation mark, Doak Lady Earth Sciences, and I just saw a mistake that I made, so I'm going to escape this right here. This will be a learning for point for you. You'll remember this because you said, hey, the professor made a mistake. There we go. I needed to italicize that. Did you see that? So next, Doak Lady Earth Sciences in italics, comma, vol, period, with a lowercase v, meaning volume, 489, comma, number, N-O, period, two, or you could put part two, comma, 2019, comma, PP, which means pages, period, 1469 to 1473, period. And that is the proper journal article citation for the journal article that we looked at a few minutes ago. Okay? How many of you got it? Raise your hand. I'm just kidding. I can't see your hands. But you get the idea. If you didn't get it like this, I want you to go back to article in a print journal 
in chapter 22, compare mine to that and see how I did it. If it still doesn't make sense, write me, call me, let's talk about it. I think it'll make sense. Again, what you're finding in chapter 22 are just templates. And you're taking that information out and putting your information in to make your information fit the same template, if that makes sense. All right, everybody got it? All right, let's do one more. Uh, this time, let's do a, a website. So we're going to go to the USGS website. Here's the United States Geological Survey website. So in Chapter 22, go to where it says Entire Website. Okay? You want to reference an entire website. Are you there? If you don't, pause it until you find it. When you do, look at that format. Now, under mine, and yours probably says the same thing. It says, under that uh, header, it says, Include the name of the person or group who created the site, if relevant, the title of the site, italicized, the publisher or sponsor of the site, the date, public, the date of publication or last update, and the URL. And so you see the templates under there, and you just make yours fit that template. Now, we don't have an author for the USGS website. If you scroll down, there's no author. However, it is uh, created by the United States Department of the Interior. The title of the website is the United States Geological Survey. It's at www.usgs.gov. It doesn't have a date of publication, but you assume with these government sites that they're updated. So the date of publication is going to be 2020. And with that information, let's go back to our slide and let's take a stab at how you would do this website. I want you to pause the, the recording and take a stab at it. All right, I hope you did that. And if you did, here is my answer. The creator... Now, in your template, it's an author, right? It's a person's name, but we don't have a person. So who created it? United States Department of the Interior. It says in here, include the name of the person or group who created it. So United States Department of the Interior. And then the website name in italics, U.S. Geological Survey, comma. Again, the site sponsor, which again is the United States Department of the Interior, comma, 2020, comma, www.usgs.gov, period. All right. That's how I would write that citation. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now, because a lot of you are going to use websites. Um, websites are hard, because you never know what you're going to get with websites. Sometimes you get a, lots of information. You might get an author's name, and you're set. You're loving life. And other times, you get virtually nothing, and you just got to do the best you can with websites, okay? But don't just give me a URL. That's not enough. You got to do the best you can um, to do it. You, you, you can do entire websites like this. You can also document... Uh, document a document from a web's, website, uh, personal website pages, online books, and stuff like that. So make sure you look at the different formats, know what you're looking at, uh, know what you're using, and uh, look at the different formats, okay? In Chapter 22. Now, that's all I'm going to talk about because I don't need to sit here and go through 40 examples. You all are smart, and Chapter 22 is right there in front of you. It's your reference book. Just use the templates in chapter 22 and make uh, and use those to write your bibliographic entries for whatever sources you're using, okay? Again, if you have questions, you're confused about how to use chapter 22, give me a call. Let's talk about it. I'm more than happy to talk, uh, talk you through uh, uh, the use of chapter 22. I think it's pretty much common sense, but if it's not, let me know. When it comes to the actual format of the paper, MLA is, uh, is pretty easy to use, I think. The hardest thing is your running page number. Now, that's at the top right-hand corner. And if you don't know how to do a running page number, uh, ask a friend, uh, ask a, uh, a, the help desk at CVCC, or you can call me. Don't, e don't email me uh, because that's going to be too hard. Uh, you can call me and we'll see if we can't walk you through it. But you want to do a running page number with your name. So in my case, if I were writing this paper, it would be Tinsley 1. The next page would be Tinsley 2. The next page, Tinsley 3, and so on and so forth. That can be done automatically for you through a running header. If you don't know how to do that, again, ask somebody. Lots of people know how to do it. Uh, you can call the help desk or you can call me. Okay, Or you can uh, call a student... Uh, the Writing Center. That's something I haven't said yet. Use the Writing Center, right? There's an online uh, format for that. If you go on the website, you can find it. Um, but use the Writing Center. They are more than happy to help you. That's what they're there for. 
the university and the state of Virginia spend a lot of money every year for these writing centers, and they want you to use them. I want you to use them. Uh, they are a valuable, valuable resource, okay? All right. Virtually everything in an MLA in the MLA format is double spaced. So you're going to start at the top of your paper on the left hand, left justified. You're going to write your name. Then you're going to double space and you're going to write your professor's name. Then you're going to double space and you're going to write your course title. So in this case, English Composition One. Double space the date you turn in your paper. Double space now centered your title, the title for your paper. Double spaced and then indent the first paragraph and roll. Okay, you're just going to keep writing after that. Uh, you only you only double space between paragraphs. Some of you were uh, spacing a lot between paragraphs. I don't know if you were trying to make up more pages on your rough drafts or, or what, what you were doing, but um, but you just double space throughout. There's only one exception to double spacing. I'll show you what it is in just a minute. But you double space everything. You double space between sentences. You double space between paragraphs. Everything is evenly spaced uh, using the MLA format. So if you make your first page look like this, obviously with your information, not mine, or not this faux information that I have here. If you make your paper format look like this, you'll be rolling with MLA. Okay? Your works cited page is the only place where you have the exception to the double space rule. Your works cited is centered and double spaced to your first entry, but each entry within the entry is, is single spaced. So Tinsley, Mark A, Elements of Science Laboratory Manual, Kindle Hunt 2015. Look at that. Between the first line and the second line of that entry is a single space. However, between entries is double spaced. So the only exception is within an entry. Also notice that that entry has a hanging indent. That is, the second line, the third line, or fourth line are all going to be indented from the first line. It's kind of opposite of a paragraph indent, right? The first line of a paragraph is intended, indented. It's actually the second and following lines of a bibliographic entry or works cited page entry that are indented. Again, if you don't know how to do a hanging indent, um, call me, call the writing center, call the help desk, call a friend, phone a friend, right? Uh, and they can help you. It's really not hard at all, but... Um, most of you know how, know how to do it, probably, or can figure it out. Or you can Google it. I haven't said that yet. Just Google it. How do I do a hanging indent? Um, you know, how do I change my spacing to double space? Um, anything that you need to do, like the, how do I do a running page number? Google it. You'll figure it out. It's really easy. Okay. Okay. I know we're running through this stuff quickly. I try to keep these lectures to about 40, 45 minutes. Um, I hope they're valuable to you. I hope you're enjoying them. I hope I'm not too monotone. <laughs> it's hard not to be uh, when you're staring at a microphone and a screen. But uh, uh, anything that I've talked about, anything with academic honesty today or anything with MLA format that you don't understand, please, please, please reach out to me. That's what I'm here for. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you uh, aren't going to have a huge problem with these things. But sometimes we do, right? Sometimes we do. And, and if you do, contact me. All right, enough said on that. Let's talk about the second essay. Um, issues with the first essay. Now, I haven't graded the first essays yet, but I can tell you that uh, typical issues that I have with these first essays are grammatical and syntactical errors. Just make sure you proofread. Most students don't proofread enough. When I do a paper, I'll proofread myself 27 times. I mean, no, no kidding. I'll read my paper 20, 30, 40, 50 times. And it, it, it gets exhausting, but you catch errors when you do that. Make sure you, you catch your grammatical and syntactical errors. I'm not, you know, if you make a few here and there, I'm not going to, you know, everybody makes mistakes. But when I start seeing error, over, error after error after error after error, I start to realize the student probably didn't proofread. Also, thesis statements, and, and most of you know this, uh, need to be one sentence. That sentence needs to be the last sentence of the introduction, and it needs to contain a topic and an assertion. We have to, I talked about that a lot when I gave feedback to, on rough drafts, so hopefully you all fix that. Topic sentences, again, are one sentence. They contain the main point of the main body paragraph, and it's the first sentence in the main body paragraph. So make sure that your topic sentences are set. You need to have three main points in your papers, and each one should have its own main body paragraph. I think I've talked this enough uh, in the past, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. But 
these are some issues that I typically find with essay number one. Okay. All right. Here's, we're going to choose a topic this week, but I'm going to make it easy on you because your, uh, your topic for essay number two is going to be the same topic for essay number one. But here's the thing. Um, we are going to, you can, by the way, I'm sorry, I should have revised this slide. Don't worry about anything that that this slide says beyond what I'm saying right now. All right, you don't have to do this yet, okay? I'll tell you what you need to do here in a second. Um, but you're going to use the same topic that you used for your first paper. Um, and we're going to just revise it. We're going to make it better based on the feedback that I'm going to give you. I haven't given you yet, but I'm going to give you. So you can semi take a, a, a relax a little bit because I'm not going to be asking you to come up with an, uh, another uh, different topic. Um, but you are going to use the same topic that you use for essay number one. We're just going to make it better based on whatever feedback I give you. Now, that doesn't mean, all right, good, I can just turn in the same paper. If you turn in the same paper uh, that you turned in the first time, you're going to get a poor grade. I want to see that you've made whatever changes I tell you to make from essay number one. Again, I haven't graded essay number one. We're a little, we're getting a little ahead of the game here, so bear with me. But relax this week until you get my feedback. Once you get my feedback, <coughs> I'm going to ask you to revise your your thesis statement and repost it uh, in Canvas. In weeks, in the week six folder, you're going to see a place to upload your thesis topics. Uh, excuse, yeah, your thesis statements. Don't do that yet until you get my feedback from SA1. As soon as you get my feedback from SA1, you can go ahead and upload your topics, and I will give you some feedback on it. Notice that next week, week seven, we don't have anything due, so that gives us the end of this week and in the week seven. Uh, to, to work out your topics for essay number two. Okay, so don't stress out. Uh, relax and uh, let me get your papers graded. And then once I get your papers graded, I'll give you more direction. Like, you know, when I send out the email that says, hey, I've graded your papers, I'll tell you, now go in and do your thesis statements for essay number two, which are going to be just a revision of the thesis statement that you did for essay number one. One. Now, some of you may have, ha may have a, I may say on your paper when I give it back to you, hey, perfect thesis statement. If that's the case, you can just copy that thesis statement over. Uh, other people might say you need to redo your thesis statement, and you'll have a little more work to do, um, if that makes sense. Okay? Now, I really need uh, everyone um, to, 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 to hear me clearly on these directions. Please, 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 just wait until I give you your, uh, your essay one comments back and then we'll worry about the topic for essay two. Okay. I know it's probably gonna be a little bit confusing and I'll try to clarify it when I send out the email tonight, uh, to everyone. Okay. All right. I know it's probably a little confusing. I I'm going to send out an email and I'll try to clarify in that. All right. All right. So format for your papers, same as always. You got a thesis statement, you got main point one, main point two, main point three, and your conclusion. We'll talk more about that uh, as we move into the future. Um, and again, I apologize if it's a little confusing what I want you to do this week, so let me review it real quick. Read chapters 21 and 22. Take quiz three. And wait on me to give your papers back with comments. Once I give your papers back with comments, I'm going to tell you to go back in and give me your thesis statement for essay two, which is going to be this. We're going to be using the same topic that you use for essay one. We're just going to be making it better. Okay. All right. I've probably thoroughly confused some of you. Email me if I have. We'll uh, we'll see what we can do. And uh, hey, let's have a great week. Week. Uh, six is going to be a blast, and we're going to have a good time. We are continuing in this class. We are moving on, moving forward and moving on, and I hope you're having a good time. I hope you're learning something. I, I want to be here as a resource for you. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, hey, I want to make this a great experience for you, so let's do it, all right? Have a great week, and I'll talk to you soon.